the theme today, since we're coming up on Thanksgiving, is thankfulness, gratitude, and it is a superpower. Uh, let's just take God out of the equation. People that have learned how to be thankful for their situations, whether they're people of faith or not, they live happier lives. They live happier, longer lives. There's actually something that takes place physiologically when we decide to be thankful. And it is a decision. It is not an, it's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. To be thankful is a decision. And we're going to learn how to do that today in today's message. Now, in order for us to fully know who King David is, we actually have to get to know his counterpart first. In essence, uh, today we're talking about the tale of two kings. But because before there was King David, there was a King Saul. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see the beginnings of of the dynasty the kingdom dynasty of Israel. And so this is how it got set up. This is how it all happened. Um, It it actually was birthed out of a bad decision. The king was birthed out of a bad decision. I'll explain. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Um, This is right after the time of the judges. They had no king. They had some prophets. They had some judges. They had some leaders. They had some warlords. Those are the people that were uh, leading the people of Israel all over that that, that land mass. And how many many tribes were there? Twelve. And they were all over the place. And they all had different opinions. They're all a little different, just like your family. Right? And so Samuel was leading them at this time. And when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. And the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. There was no Jerusalem yet. Well, there was, but they hadn't set it up. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gained and they accepted bribes, and they perverted justice. So the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came for Samuel at Ramah. And they, and they said to him, you are old. Has anybody said that to you lately? <laughs> yes. You are old. And your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said this, when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. And so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, he listened to all the people and what they are saying to you. It is not that they have rejected you, but they have rejected me as their king. Ouch. This is a fascinating idea, right? So the initial idea in God's heart and God's mind is that people would be free, free of a king. Well, with the exception of King Jesus. They have rejected me as their king. And they have done as they have as they have done from the day that I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. And so they are doing to you. So now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim as his will claim his rights, meaning that he's going to own them. Verse down to verse 17, he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king that you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us. And to go out and fight our battles. 
And this is how, how deceived they were. But they just didn't realize that Yahweh was already fighting their battles for them. So Samuel heard all of the people said. He re- repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered and said, listen to them and give them a king. Ouch. So sometimes God will give you what you ask for, even though it might not be good for you. That's a sobering thought to think about, huh? So just be careful of what you ask for. And so, for sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase the rest of the story. So Samuel is on, he's commissioned by God to answer the people's request for a king. And God highlights to Samuel who the man will be. And it's not David, not yet. But it is a man named Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin's the smallest tribe out of all of Israel. And, and, and then Saul will say, I am of a tiny clan inside the smallest tribe, and I am least of my family. So right out of the gate, this guy that God has chosen to be the leader, he's got a lot of negative self-talk already wired into his mind. He's already saying, I can't do it. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm nobody. Um, interestingly enough, the Word of God describes him as dark, tall, and handsome. He's like the Cary Grant of the Jews. Cary Grant probably was a Jew, I'm not sure. But he's like tall, dark, and handsome. He's everything that you would ever want in the leader. And you know, we're going to go through some of his character flaws, but he was also a good warrior. And he was a decent tactician. And so he had all the skills to pull it off, and yet he doesn't. Regardless, Samuel finds him and anoints him as king. And this is how the story goes. Um, Saul's dad, Kish, loses some donkeys. Have you ever lost some donkeys? Have you ever lost your keys? Have you ever lost your wallet? Have you ever lost something? Right? Okay. It's a terrible feeling. This guy lost his donkeys. And... He tells Saul, he's like, you need to go find my donkeys. And so Saul goes on this long journey to find dad's donkeys. And uh, his, his servant, Saul's servant, says, you know what? I heard of this guy, this holy man named Samuel, and he, he knows the future. He can see in the spirit. He's actually what the Bible calls him this too. He is a seer. That's kind of a scary word, right? He is a seer. He can see things that, that normal people can't see. And chances are, if we ask him, and maybe if we pay him, he'll see your donkeys, and then we can get this thing over with and go home. And so they, they search out, and they find Samuel. And Samuel already knew, because he's a seer. He saw them coming. He saw them coming before they got there. He said, hey, welcome. And they're excited to see him. Uh, Samuel's not surprised, and he's on a mission. He's going to anoint this kid as king. Makes them stay the night, has a fancy meal, does some ceremonial stuff. Samuel, or Saul's like, I need to find my donkeys. Samuel's like, don't worry about the donkeys. The donkeys are fine. You're in the presence of the Lord. And and Saul, or Samuel anoints Saul with oil. And the oil goes on his head and begins to flow over him. And the scriptures say that in that moment, Saul was changed. He was a changed man. He became anointed to do what God had called him to do. And from there, Samuel says, you need to go and... Uh, let's see, what, what's a musical town? Nashville. You need to go to Nashville, and you need to hang out with some musicians, and you need to sing with them. And so they go to this town, and there's all of these, uh, there's all of these prophets that are coming out of the, ta- of the town, and they're singing, and they're chanting. Our Western minds don't quite get what's taking place, but it probably make most of us feel very uncomfortable what was taking place. And they are, they're prophesying. And then Samuel gets caught up into something that he has never experienced before. He is a, he's, a, he's a farmer. He's a warrior. He is a, he's of no respect. And all of a sudden, he gets caught up into this, 
into this religious expression that he's never seen before, and he's never been trained. He didn't go to prophecy school. Did not go to prophecy school. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon him, and he started prophesying just like all of these other trained prophets did. And he does it for a very long time. And Samuel says, you are now the king. And then he goes home. Donkeys have been returned. They came home, right? Thought the donkeys weren't the problem. And the family says, Saul, you've been gone for a couple days. Where have you been? Well, he doesn't say, he doesn't say, well, I can't, the strangest thing happened to me. I got anointed by the Holy Spirit and I began to prophesy even though I've never done that in my entire life. He didn't say that. He didn't say, the strangest thing happened on me. The, this, this, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and it changed who I am. Like it literally changed me from the inside out. Didn't say that. He didn't say, well, there's this really strange seer who is actually the leader of all Israel right now. And he anointed my head with oil, and he made me king over the 12 tribes. He didn't say that. You, know, wanna, you wanna know what he said? He says, I've been looking for donkeys. He's been looking for donkeys. Like he had all these amazing things happen, life transformative experiences. And yet, the, he's, he's, a, he's ashamed to talk about it. We're not quite sure exactly what, what's going on in his head. And when, when, Saul, when Samuel finally shows up to the scene, when he shows up to, to their, their little clan, he's looking for him. Like, it's time to go to work, Saul. It's time to sit on your throne. Like, Saul's hiding. He's hiding behind some bushels of wheat. He doesn't want to be found. He's like, okay, he's, he's insecure. Why is he so insecure? insecure now when we're talking about Saul I want you to know I'm also talking about you and I'm talking about me because everybody's got a little bit of Saul inside of us but also everybody's got a little bit of David inside of us so we're going to go after the better but we need to we need to know and this is why this story is this is why the tale of two kings one's insecure and one is completely secure in the Lord this is what we need to flesh out why is he so insecure I mean, like, who wouldn't want to be the king? He doesn't want to be the king. Maybe he knows a little bit about these 12 tribes. Like, these 12 tribes, they're all over the place, geographically and, you know, and and, and what they believe and what they think and, and what's taking place in this moment in history with the 12 tribes of Israel is that the culture is seeping into their uh, a, a cult. It's not a cult. It's seeping into the religion. They're being influenced by Philistines. They're being influenced by Canaanites. They're being influenced by Amalekites. Like all of these competing cultures are coming in and they're corrupting the purity of the people of God. And now Saul, his number one mission is to take these 12 tribes and to unite them. And so maybe one reason why he doesn't want to do it is because he maybe, comes, maybe he knows that it's going to be a tough job. It's not going to be like herding cats. It's going to be like herding porcupines. It's going to be like herding honey badgers. Like these people don't get along. You know, there's always this one tribe that's, uh, that's always combative. They just want to fight all the time. It doesn't matter if, you know, if everything is smooth. They're just looking for a fight. You know anybody that just is looking for a fight? And then there's the other tribe that they just complain all the time. They're just looking for something to gripe about. They're looking for something to whine about. So he's like, I don't want to have to deal with those people either. And then there's the flighty tribe, the, the tribes in the north. They just kind of like wander around. No one, no, no one knows where they're at. It's going to kind of sound like your Thanksgiving uh, weekend, right? And so maybe he just doesn't want to do it because he knows that it's going to put a huge demand on him. And so somewhere along the way, even though he has been anointed, even though that he has been called, even though that he has been empowered and he has everything that he needs. And again, he's he's dark, tall, and handsome. He's got every, he's got the natural ability. 
And he's got the supernatural ability to pull the job off. And yet he doesn't. And so there is this insecurity that begins to well up. And as we get into the stories, we're going to see more and more of it. He's going to he's going to become very jealous of David pretty soon. He is going to he he's obsessed with the future. He's not a present person. He's not a person that is in the moment. He wants to know what the future is. He's insecure about what will be. And people that are insecure about the future, they need to trust the Lord more, and he can't do that. He can't be in the moment. And so he goes outside of God's will, and he goes, and it, well, eventually he's going to seek, uh, you know, witchcraft to find the future. Not a good idea, by the way. I say it every once and again. I think I said it last week. Stay away from witchcraft stuff, folks. Tarot cards, voodoo, horoscopes, the little black eight ball thing that you shake up and like just like stay away. Ouija boards are the worst. Get them out. We're not messing around anymore. Game time is over. There is a downright dirty spiritual warfare that's taking place. You got to get all that crap out of our house. Amen. All right. Sorry. Okay. And so he messes around with that kind of stuff. And the guy's impatient. We're going to see him become very impatient. Samuel's running late to a big event. Imagine that, a pastor running late to an event. (laughs) And and Saul's like, we've got to get this party started. Where's the priest? Where's the seer? Where's this guy? Like, we've got to sacrifice some animals. We've got to get it going. You know, we've got some battles to win. And... um, Remember when Napoleon took the crown away from the priest and put it on his own head and anointed himself? Remember that? Saul does the same thing, except he takes the turban off of the priest's head and anoints himself a priest. was not his right to do it, and he begins to perform priestly rites without Samuel being there. Huge mistake. And that's the turning point. That's when God said, okay, I can't work with this guy because he's insecure, he's rebellious, he has to be in control. He's a control freak. Like, the guy was just broken all the way down. As I was reading through the story of Saul and 1 Samuel, this is important for us today. You need to get it. As I was reading through his story, like, well, man, this, guy is, this guy's got problems, right? This guy's jacked up. I mean, he's been given... He's been given success on a platter from the Lord, and he's messing everything up. Do you want to know what the difference between the two kings is? Never once, never once does Saul say, ready for this? Thank you, Lord. He never gives thanks. I mean, God just anointed him king. He doesn't say, I don't feel worthy, Lord, but thank you, for, thank you for this opportunity. He never does that. He never comes humbly into God's presence and says, God, I don't feel worthy. Regardless, thank you for trusting me. Like He doesn't do any of that. He is this one bitter critter. And his inability to be thankful for his situation, good situations and bad situations, his inability to do that literally hinders God's hand from moving. It holds God's hand back. Do you, okay, again, like I said, we know in psychology that thankfulness is a, is a, it's a power up in your mind and it's going to make you feel better. It's going to make you think differently. Like psychologically, it's going to make you better. I'm telling you today, spiritually, it will open up huge doors for you in your life. But you have to be thankful. And let's just see how David does it. Three points. <laughs> Number one is that David is thankful from the very beginning. The basis of things to be thankful for, David is thankful for it. So, meaning, 
Well, when David gets anointed, he's going to say thank you, right? He's going to have a, he has a different heart, a different position of his heart. But also, David is saying thank you to God, and he's praising God for a lot of things that we just normally uh, let slip by. I was thinking about doing this. Um, maybe I should do it. Okay, what are you thankful for? I'm gonna, yeah, you, you just say it out loud. What are you thankful for? You got a salvation here. That's a good one. What are you thankful for? Family. Peace. God. Life. Miracles. Health. Dogs and houses. God's mercy and grace. Bella, the Word of God. You guys are on a good track. This is good. House of the Lord. All right. So some of you that did not speak up, I guess you have nothing to be thankful for. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I have nothing to be thankful for in this season. I can't think of a single thing to say, wow, God, thank you. I am grateful for, for what's going on. You know, I'll be transparent. I've been in those situations. Life. Life. Your breath. You're sucking air right now. You woke up this morning. And drug yourself to church. Like you have, you, you have life to be thankful for. But you have a beating heart inside of, your, inside of your chest. You might have to take medication to keep it going right now, but it is still beating. You've got so much to be thankful for right now. David knew the secret of this. Like, like this is the foundation of, of his thankfulness. There's two scriptures that show us this. Psalms 51, verses 4 through 5. This, this scripture is going to pop up again when we talk about Bathsheba because this is one of these scriptures that he's talking about where he's, he's praying to the Lord because he got himself in big trouble. All right, but there's something else that's going on, and I kind of wanna, I wanna read in between the lines a bit. So this is his kind of this is his repentance scripture, okay? And in in some ways, this is um, he's making an excuse for his sin. Has anybody ever made excuses for their sin and behavior? Okay, he's kind of doing that. We're not exactly sure, but whatever he's doing, he's processing it in a healthy way. And he says, "Against you." You only I have sinned. And so he's saying that he sinned against the Lord. And I have done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin... My mother conceived me. Other, other translations say roughly, uh, behold, uh, I was born a sinner. This is actually where we get the theological idea of, of original sin. That, that you know, we're, we have two natures when we're born. Uh, we're born in the image of God, the imago Dei. Like, God, like God's got his DNA, he's got his thumbprint on us. We are, we are so much like God. You're more like God than you realize. You are a child of the, the, the Lord Most High. Like he values you above anything else. You are his children. We are made in his image. And yet, we're also born into this broken, sinful world. So there's also this concept of original sin. And this is where we get it. David says, I was... I was I was brought forth. I was born a sinner. I was brought forth in iniquity. And then he says this, and there's a lot that we, 
I wish there was more, but there's not. I wish we could really know what was going on. And he said, in, and in sin, my mother conceived me. Uh, other scriptures say, in shame, I was conceived. Uh, we know that David had a bunch of older brothers. He's the youngest. And when, he's, when, when Saul's looking for the next king, all the brothers are lined up. They leave David out. And so it, it's, it's speculation. Uh, we, we don't know who David's mother is. There's some ideas, but they're kind of weak. But what can be implied is that maybe, just maybe, this was, David was illegitimate. Or maybe he was, um, you know, maybe it was the handmaid, or maybe it was a, a next wife. Like, we don't know the details. We just know it was complicated. Does that maybe make you feel a little bit better? That, that God chose a king from somebody that was born from sin? Like, David's life was not perfect. So I, he says, I, my, I was conceived in sin. He says, I am a sinner by nature. You know what's, and then let me read the next one. This is Psalms 139, 11 through 14. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will, will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. Okay, here we go. Here we go. You ready? For you created my innermost being. Who says that? David says that. You created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I give thanks to you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That word praise, you can also use it as I'm thankful. I'm grateful. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. And this is coming from most likely the redheaded stepchild. Okay? This is coming from somebody that's probably got some, some wounds. He wasn't accepted in his own family. He even says that he, his own brothers and his own families have rejected him. So if you think that you got family problems coming up this weekend, like he's got family problems too. The beautiful thing is that God is with him. The beautiful thing is that God sees something that inside of us that we don't even see inside of ourselves. David is thankful that he was born. I want to encourage you to be thankful that you're born. That that the Lord knitted you together in your mother's womb. And maybe the situation wasn't a good situation. Maybe it wasn't ideal. Maybe it wasn't the Judeo-Christian way. But this is what we do know. This is because we know this about God's heart. Is that God doesn't make mistakes. And nobody on the planet is a mistake. Some 15 years ago, I read this scripture that the Lord knitted you together in your mother's womb and that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It was 15 years ago, so I don't remember the whole, I don't remember the sermon. I don't remember the title. Chances are I'm not going to remember this sermon by uh, 5 o'clock this afternoon. You probably won't either. But 15 years ago, Somebody did remember one of my sermons. Church family member drug her sister to church. Like sometimes you just need to drag them to church, folks. She came kicking and screaming. She didn't want to come. I don't know. Maybe there was a little guilt. Maybe there was a little shame. Like, come to church because you need it. (laughs) And everybody knows you need it. You know, you need to be encouraged. Come to church. So it was that type of a thing. And um, 
this gal that came to church for the very first time heard that scripture. And on that Sunday, she decided not to terminate her pregnancy. And now she's blessed with life, a 15-year-old boy that they're going to be having Thanksgiving with. I don't know, again, I don't know what Sunday that was. I was probably done preaching. I was like, man, that was a lousy sermon. You know, I was probably beating myself up. I was probably a little insecure. But you're just not quite sure exactly who needs to hear the word of God in your life. Like, what, 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 thing that, what, what could you say to change somebody's destiny forever? What, what little seed can you plant? What, what, what glimmer of hope can you give somebody that will make a difference, and just like Saul, will be in an anointing upon them that will literally change them from the inside out. Sometimes it's just a word or a scripture or a prayer. We don't even realize how powerful our prayers are these days, but they're, they're powerful, folks. And the word of God is powerful. So David knew this secret. He knew that he had to be thankful for his life because, well... Again, we don't know the situation, but like it wasn't good for mom. Like socially, it was not good for mom. And uh, abortion was a thing in the ancient world. It's not a new thing just because we have Planned Parenthood. It's not a new phenomenon. It, it, it happened in the ancient world. I know because I dug in a site that had an abortion clinic, a 4,000-year-old abortion clinic. It was kind of disturbing. Anyway, so... It was a huge decision, and it was a decision that, that, that changed the world. So value your life, even though you don't want to. I'm going to say this, too. So there is, upon our culture, I know it's a fight right now, but upon our culture, there is a, there is a spirit of death. There's a full-blown death cult that we are being assimilated into. And we need to avoid it at all cost. Life is so precious. Your life is so precious. And if this death cult mentality begins to infiltrate your mind and, and puts these really negative thoughts inside of your head that says that your life is not worth living, then you need to cast that thought out in the name of Jesus. You need to hold every thought captive and make them obedient to Christ. Look, I know life is hard, and I know, it, and I know it's, it's, it's difficult to get through, but just don't ever give up. Just don't give up. Don't give up on your life. Don't give up on the lives of others. Even if you're not, even if you don't have the suicidal tendencies, still don't give up on hope. Like, just don't go through the motions as waiting to die someday. Have hope, have life, be like David, and be thankful for it. Yes, amen. Bottom level, I could probably stop right there. Oh my gosh, I gotta stop right there. <laughs> I got other two, I got two more points, but I can't get to them. All right, real quick. Uh, David, point number two. David had the ability to be thankful when things were really bad. Like really, really bad. Like when, when Saul would be complaining about a situation, David would be like, oh man, this sucks, but I thank my God that he's with me and he's pulling me out of the slimy pit. He's pulling me out of the muck and mire. Okay, so when you're in your hardest situation, find something to be thankful for. It is so difficult to be thankful when, you, when you're in the midst of it, when you're you know, up to your neck in problems. I get it. But again, in the hardest, okay, this is going to be tough. I want to encourage you to be even thankful for the hard situation that you are in. Why? Because it's making you better. It's making you stronger. It's making you faster. You need to be able to learn from adversity. You need to be able to learn from difficulty. Like if you're struggling with your finances, maybe God's just putting, letting this happen so that you'll budget better. I don't know. But you can learn something from the hardship that you are in. And there's a mission, there's a mission for you in that hardship. There's a ministry for you in that hardship. So embrace, my mark says this, embrace the suck. Yep. <laughs> embrace the suck. And learn from it. Let the problem make you better. Don't let the problem tear you down and break you down. Let the problem make you better. David does that with, I mean, he does that incredibly well. 
And then the other thing that he does is that David is able to say, thank you when God blesses. How many times have you been, you've been crying out to the Lord, you've been praying to God to solve a problem, and you're, like, you're pleading, and you're on your knees, and then you get the miracle. And you're like, oh, that's cool. Do-do-do. And you completely forget how bad things really were. You completely forget that you were, you were in that muck and the mire, and the Lord pulled you out. And now you're just like back to life as normal. And you forget to thank God for the blessing. You forget to live in a constant state of gratitude. And if the enemy gets inside of your head, he's going to say, you did this. You pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. You're awesome. You don't need God. You can do it on your own. Like, just don't let those lies seep into your head. Like, once you get victory, in the midst of victory, in the midst of success, when you find yourself on the right hand of the throne, like, you need to be thankful and grateful and you need to be praising God for it. Yes. Never forget to thank God. Never forget to thank God. All right. Larry, let's get the band to come on up. I know that was three. One really good uh, defined point, and two that will, well, it's just, yeah, you can. But we have a bonus point. We have bonus point number four. And we get to be thankful for Jesus. We get to be thankful that, that we are invited to his Thanksgiving table to receive this Thanksgiving meal. And it's not turkey. It's bread. And it's not cranberry juice. It's wine. And God is so happy to invite you to this table. We get to be thankful that we've been invited to his table. We get to be thankful and grateful that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and that he rose again on the third day so that we could live life and live it to the fullest. We have so much to be grateful for and thankful for. Get your elements out. This is the body of Christ. This is the best Thanksgiving meal you'll ever eat. It is tasty. It is good. It is filling. You will not want for anything if you continue to abide in this and eat the flesh of our Savior. You will never be lonely if you abide in the body of Christ and always stay connected to one another. Life is good. Life is worth living when we eat of his, of his flesh and we receive his provision. Receive the body of Christ for your connectivity to the Lord. David was 100% right and accurate when he wrote that psalm that said, I was born a sinner. That's right. You were all born sinners. You do things that you don't want to do. You think thoughts that you don't want to think. You, uh, you're a hurt person, and so you hurt people. But there is a new way of doing life new way of doing business and it resides inside of this cup this cup says yeah you were born a sinner but I've designed you and destined you to be a saint because you are made in my image and this is what this cup does it washes away all of our sin all of our iniquity it even washes away the iniquity of our parents and our grandparents it washes away generational curses and mindsets that are of the devil. We need to receive this drink and let it wash us clean and pure. Receive the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this week that we get to be thankful in hearts and gracious in actions. God, right now, I just pray a special blessing to everybody that's got a new family with hard family people. I pray that you will give us a divine grace to love, the, to love them, to 
even love their politics. God, right now, we just pray for encouragement and that, that the kingdom of God will enter into the living room and the dining room table. My friends, when you hold hands around the table, pray a blessing over the food like your life depends upon it. The life of your family members depend upon it. Pray powerful prayers this Thanksgiving. May God bless you and encourage you.